Hi, this is Pastor Alex Lepos of the House Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Tonight, we're studying spiritual warfare, the myths and the realities. And so I'm going to ask Justin to open up in prayer. Justin, would you pray, please? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, today. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible study that we can have. We thank you, Lord, for your knowledge uh, that you can impart of in part to each and every one of us to learn uh, even deeper into your word and to your uh, precepts that you have for us. So um, we thank you, Lord, for tonight for the uh, spiritual warfare um, subject that we're going to have. And we pray, Lord, that you may uh, help us to apply the knowledge in our everyday life. We thank you, Lord, for tonight in Jesus name. Amen. 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 want to welcome Christina Brooks and Paul James. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, we're going to begin with a, about a 13 minute presentation, an overview of spiritual warfare, which I thought was very solid. I always look for stuff that is solid and biblical. I don't wanna get into fantasies and mysticism and crazy stuff like that. So here we go with a summary on spiritual warfare to introduce our topic. Here we go. To a Grace Digital presentation. We discuss how to resist the devil and live a life of power, dominion, authority, and free of sin. Our enemy, the devil, has... There are a couple of ads that come up in, uh, while this goes on, so just ignore them. ...never needed an invitation to come our way. As a matter of fact, the devil still needs no invitation before he comes your way. He's ready, always alert, and always prepared to move in at the least chance. No wonder he's known as the prince of the power of the air, as he's always going about to and fro, looking for who or what to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible says in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9 also says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You see, our arch enemy won't flee because you look all so nice and gently, or because you live peaceful, not disturbing anybody. The devil won't flee because you're kind or have all the fruits of the Spirit reflecting in your life. The devil won't flee because you're a strong member of your church. As a matter of fact, the mere fact that you are so involved and active in everything church is not enough reason for him to flee. Giving out your tithes and offering on the regularly will not move him either. By the verse in the book of James which once again says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil only flees, and will continue to flee, only when you resist him. It takes a certain strength for him to bend or bow. He is an enemy, and you are fighting with him. You are engaged with him in battle. You do not cajole or beg the devil because he's not that kind of person. He's a force to reckon, and we are wrestlers. We engage him in battle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6.12 You never see wrestlers begging one another in the ring, do you? The instruction according to scripture is resist the devil, and he will flee. It does not say beg him or beg God and he will flee, no. It says resist him and he will flee. It's about time you took charge and refused to let Satan have his way. Stand against him. Take charge now. You are the boss. Show him that you are. Many Christians do not have any form of resistance in them. Neither God nor your pastor will resist the devil for you. A million demons may be cast out from an individual, and before you know it, this person acquires another two million. You see, every evil spirit has been given the permission by God to make its abode somewhere. Good news is you can keep them off of your territory. There appears to be many Christians today who allow the devil to prevail in their lives without any resistance. The Christians who will succeed in these last days are soldiers. You can't be a kid forever. The Bible says that a child is no better than a slave. 
because he or she remains under governors and educators until he or she grows up to become of age. Although everything belongs to this child, he or she enjoys nothing till then. Galatians 4, 1 and 2. Now let's take a look at the weapons of our resistance made available to us by God. We see the devil come to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Being aware that Jesus was hungry after 40 days fasting, the devil said to him, Turn these stones into bread. If you read on, you'll realize that Jesus did not just tell him to keep quiet. And so, friend, that is how to resist the devil. You have at your disposal a weapon of resistance, which Jesus himself used. He said to Satan, It is written. Men who carry the word of God in themselves and are wise to take it out of their mouths in faith are men who keep the devil from their shores. After Jesus had said, It is written, the devil had to look for something else. When you engage the devil in the realm of, It is written, he is unable to proceed any further. This is a realm where his movement is restricted and can never proceed further in his agenda against us. This is the language of resistance, the power that the devil cannot resist. Satan will always bow to it. When Jesus spoke these words by faith, the devil could not go any further. There are many areas where the devil is trying to bully you. The way to stop him is to take the word of God out of your heart, a word that stands in the way of his evil plans. When the devil came to Jesus the second time, Jesus said again, It is written. He did not pray, and there was no one around him with whom he could pray a prayer of agreement. The devil came back a third time, and Jesus, in his usual resilience, gave it to him again. It is written. This time, the devil came to the conclusion, I can't do anything with this man. Luke 4, 13 says, When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. A man who values the word of God will earn great respect for himself. He will be respected in the kingdom of darkness. We are not talking about religion, but about living a spirit-filled and dominant Christian life. Each prayer without the word of God cannot do any harm to the devil. If Satan threatens you with the fear of death, all you have to say is, it is written that those who worship God will live long and fulfill the number of their days. Satan, your death threat over my life cannot stand. I am a child of God. I am of God's royal family, and I have overcome you. He is greater who is in me than he who is in the world. The devil leaves men who speak this kind of language quickly. When he draws up a list of people he cannot touch, he will include you. I know Jesus, I know Paul, and he will add your name. Always declare that it is written. When you do, do well to make sure it comes from a depth where doubt has no access, from the depth of your heart. The time has come to do what Jesus did. All the time you spend running around looking for people to help you can be spent with the word of God. Look for the guarantees that exist for you in the battles you're facing. That's all you need. Just find the right word and get on with it. The devil must certainly bow, because the word of God is that light that shines in darkness, and darkness to which has no answer. John 1, 5 The more darkness there is, the more light is shining. For this reason, the devil has no answer to the light. The devil cannot hang around your life if the word of God has the upper hand there. So all you have to do is be intoxicated by the word of God, to be ready every day to release. It is written. Never sit around the table with trouble. Expose it. As long as you don't get to that point on a battlefield, the devil has what he wants. True victory is to win it in the face of the enemy, not behind them. There is nothing more exciting than for your enemy to see you progress. The devil is the thief. Unless you stand firm against him, he will continue to steal, kill, and destroy. You can resist the devil. You can walk out on him. In Revelation 12, 12, the Bible says, But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. In this day and age in which we find ourselves to remain an earthly Christian is a curse. 
The devil was thrown down to the earth with great anger. You can't stay earthly and survive as a Christian. All you have to do is live in the newness of life God's given you. And this is possible only on the basis of your agreement with God, operating the terms that will keep you in the heavenly realm where you're seated with Christ. There is trouble on this earth right now. Security can only be found in the heavenly. That is why Revelation 12:12 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. There are both heavenly and earthly Christians. When I speak of heavenly Christians, I mean those who have been translated from the earthly realm with God because of the quality of their walk with God. People whose walk with God has distinguished them on earth. It is time to ask for a translation for your Christian adventure. Your distinction on earth is determined by the quality of your relationship with God. Only your agreement with God guarantees his walk with you. Heaven is his throne. Therefore, if you walk with him as you agree with him, Amos 3.3, 3, he will lead you from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm, far above all principalities and powers and rulers of this evil world and all evil spirits in the heights. Long for a translated status in your Christian adventure, for here you will find heavenly security. From now on, as you stand where he has commanded you to stand and do what he has commanded you to do, he begins to walk with you and lead you into the heavenly kingdom where he makes his dwelling. The devil's ministry revolves around stealing, killing, and destroying. But in God, you have a city of refuge where you can run for covering. The closer the end approaches, the more evil will prevail. Fear not, for the city of refuge is your shield against the wickedness of the wicked. No city can be safer than this city, because God dwells there. Our city of refuge is Zion, the place where the children of God gather in his name. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place for ever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned. For I have desired it. Psalms 132, 13 and 14. Zion is a place designated by God as a refuge for the oppressed, a place of appointment with God. It is there God takes time to relate to his people. Everywhere God's people gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus, God has put his name there. It is Zion. Everywhere one sees people who are attracted to God himself and who are saved healed, transformed and blessed, that is God's dwelling place. It is he who draws people there. If you deceived, oppressed, robbed, or in any way deprived, he said, come to me and seek reparation. Matthew 11:28. If something is not going well for you, don't sleep over it, or it will overwhelm you at some point. Go to God in Zion and tell him, but on Mount Zion will be deliverance, it will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Obadiah 17 For every time we enter the house of God, our strength is renewed and we live refreshed and strengthened from within and without. Psalm 84 7 There is enough security in Zion to keep you alive. Isaiah 25 8 Death is swallowed up by God and the believer is delivered from its claws. God also wipes the tears of the wicked from your face. All things are answered in Zion. Psalm 48, 2. That is why it is said to be beautiful for situations. The city of refuge is there for you to find protection and security. You can walk out on the devil. We hope you were blessed by this message. Okay, in case you were wondering or you're confused, Zion would be your local church or your local Bible study or a group of believers that you gather with and study and pray with uh, on a regular basis. That's what Zion is, the house of God. And the house of God is made up of people. So, okay, that's a great uh, introduction. And we're going to start our Bible study right now, going to the word of God. The whole topic of spiritual warfare has been seriously affected by the following influences. And unfortunately, these influences are not good ones, not good ones at all. So I'm just going to go through some of them, and I'm going to tell you what influence they've had and how they've affected 
Christian's attitudes towards spiritual warfare actually weakening the church. First of all, there was this book that came out uh, 30 or 40 years ago called Pigs in the Parlor. This was a really, really unfortunate publication because in this book, there was an outline of every kind of demon and every kind of demon name, demon hierarchies, networks of demons. It was all outlined there. And there was a whole bunch of rituals and practices and methods and things that you had to go through to be able to deal with these specific demons. For, their, for example, there might have been a demon of gluttony, a demon of lust, a demon of uh, murder, a demon of warfare. There was a demon for everything. And they were part of networks. And on top of these networks were these higher demons. And on top of them, even more powerful demons. Now, it's true that the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 19, that there is a hierarchy and there is a realm, an actual structure in the kingdom of darkness. But we're not to know what that structure is. And we're not to study what that structure is. So what happened with this book is that Christians went around trying to understand, trying to figure out where all the demons are, what their names are, because this book told them that unless you knew the names and you knew the structures and you knew the, the ins and outs of the occult, that you couldn't deal with it. So it left a very, very bad impression in the minds of Christians and got them focused on demonic activity rather than on the Lord. And, the, and that's what the enemy likes to do. He likes to get you so focused on himself and take you away from Jesus. And when you focus on the enemy too much, he will be in your face and his demons will be in your face constantly. So it's through your thoughts that he attacks you and through your emotions. And if you're constantly focusing on him and thinking about him or believing that he has some kind of hold over you, you've got yourself a real problem because all you're doing is inviting him in to oppress you. Then there was this book called Deliver Us From Evil. A Pastor's Reluctant Encounter with the Powers of Darkness by Don Basham. Now, I read both these books oh, way back when I first gave my heart to the Lord. And the, both of these books were kind of focused on the same thing. And that was the experience of the people that wrote them. The problem was that the experience does not line up with scripture at all. It's the experience of people who got deep into fighting demons and trying to find out all they could about them and making a lifetime of studying them to the point where they kept showing up all over the place, which is extremely unusual and extremely rare. I can't make that point. I can't emphasize that point more strongly. Yeah, but with these two books, people got the idea that there were demons everywhere and that we were constantly fighting them. And there were endless, numerous, innumerable, rather hordes of devils attacking Christians and making their life miserable, which is absolutely false. Then there was this guy right here. His name was Bob Larson. Now, Bob Larson's ministry was a deliverance ministry, and he started out okay. He taught about spiritual warfare from a biblical perspective, had a radio program, but then he started to go a little bit wacky. And almost every day on his radio program, somebody called who was supposedly demon-possessed, and he would deliver them over the radio. From that, he went to traveling from place to place, city to city, all over the world, having these huge gatherings, these huge meetings in which he spent the entire time confronting so-called demon-possessed people and casting demons out. And everything he taught on demonic activity after that was based on his subjective experience and not on the word of God. So again, he was one of the guys that made people think, made Christians think that the devil is so powerful and he's all over the place and you constantly have to fight him and cast him out, otherwise he'll overwhelm you. Then there were these two influences here. This one was from Hollywood. This one was from the Christian literature uh, business. This is a picture from the movie, The Exorcist. The Exorcist was about a little girl who got possessed. She had an imaginary friend called Captain Howdy. And it turned out that this Captain Howdy was a demon. And he began to oppress this little girl and take her over. He altered her face. He began to beat her and torture her and cut her open and so a Catholic priest by the name of Father Marin, which is this individual right here, was called to this house to be able to confront this demon. And so the fight went on. The whole movie was centered around the fight between this priest and this demonic spirit, what was in the girl. And it went on and on and on and on and on. And the enemy or the devil in this movie pulverized the priest, absolutely pulverized him, which gave people the false impression 
that the devil is more powerful than God and that if you're going to deal with him and cast him out, it will take hours and hours and hours and hours and you will be involved in a huge fight for days and days. And in that fight, you will be beaten to a pulp. And that also gave a false impression of spiritual warfare because none of this, not one word of it, not one iota of it is found in scripture. And then finally, there was this book that came out a few years ago by Frank Peretti called Piercing the Darkness. And this was about a little church that was being harassed by a horde of demons who used that church as a front to be able to control a particular community. The pastor went into that church and tried to confront these evil spirits. But the thing about Piercing the Darkness was, is that Peretti took great liberty in describing wars and battles and fights between angels and demons in which if Christians didn't pray, the angels didn't have the power to overcome the evil spirits. And it gave people the impression that there's this war between angels and demons going on all over the place, and that somehow we affect the outcome, that if we don't pray, the angels of God will be overcome and the enemy will have his way, which is absolutely blatantly false because the angels of God are way more powerful than demons, and there are not a whole bunch of spiritual wars going on all over the place. There may be some here and there, but not all the time and not everywhere and certainly not in everybody's life. So these five influences, one, two, three, four, five, gave people an impression that the devil is so powerful and that we really have to fight him and he's all over the place and there is special ways of being able to deal with him. And unless we know these secrets and unless we know how the, the occult is structured and we know how the enemy works, we can't cast him out. And even at that, as Christians, we can barely cast him out because Jesus is just a little bit stronger than the enemy, which is an absolute falsehood and a lie. Anyone in Jesus Christ has absolute, total, total authority over demons, and they must obey what you say, provided that you're walking in God. But these five influences have made Christians think otherwise, and their influence, unfortunately, is being continued to this day. Every book that you'll read on spiritual warfare will have some of the premises that were offered by these five influences somewhere. So today we're going to put together a theology of spiritual warfare, focusing only on scripture. Let me just write in the word warfare in there. Whoops. There we are. Focusing only on scripture, because we don't really care what people's fiction say. We don't care what Hollywood says. We don't care what people say based on their experience over focusing on demonic spirits and inviting them in. We want to know what the word of God says about spiritual warfare. So let us begin here with Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Okay, so we know from the scripture there is a hierarchy, but we don't need to know what that hierarchy is or all the details of it and the names of the different levels of it. They're not necessary. All we need to know is how to fight. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, and here's how we stand, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, and above all, taking the shield of, shield of faith, which with you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always in all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel in this passage of scripture is all you need to be able to resist the enemy well let's find out what all these things are how do we put on truth anyone just give me quick answers because we have a lot to cover how do we put on truth? with the word of God? That's right. To be in line with the word of God. And that's the only place you're going to find truth that the enemy will recognize. How do we put on righteousness? Anyone? Being born again and with Christ. That's right. Looking to Jesus for righteousness. He's the only one that actually can make us righteous. If we stand before the enemy in our own righteousness or because we're good people or because we pray or go to church, he will 
not acknowledge that. He will not recognize that at all. Someone else, please. How can we put on the gospel of peace? What do we need to do for that? Anyone? I'm going to call on people so that we can just get rolling because we have a ton to cover. Mark Zarbatani, how do we put on the gospel of peace? Is that by sharing his word? That's one way. Is there something else we need to do before we share the word? It's kind of uh, kind of obvious, actually. Soak in it and rest in his presence. Soak in it and rest in his presence. But there's something specific with relating to sharing the gospel that if we don't do, we can't share it. Read you know, it. Read your Bible. You got to read your Bible. Got to read your Bible. We're getting closer. But you've got to do what? The what will the Bible? filled with the Holy Spirit. That's one thing. But there's something else we need to do to be able to share the gospel. It's Obey the most the gospel. What's that? Obey the word of God. Well, you can't obey the word of God if what? You know Unless it you in say? your heart. Memorize it. Okay, you've got to know what the gospel is. and <laughs> You can't share it if you don't know what it is. So you need to train yourself from the word of God or from some other materials given by reputable Bible scholars to learn what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. He rose from the dead in triumph. Anyone who puts faith in him overcomes sin and overcomes the grave and will live forever in the kingdom of God. That's the gospel. And apart from Jesus, there is no other salvation. So you've got to know the gospel to put on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's go back to our, <laughs> our Bible study. How do you put on, how do we, how do we, what is that? How do we excel? It should be exercised. How do we exercise faith? Anyone? Faith is the shield that fends off all of the all of the fiery darts of the enemy. So how do we use faith? Anyone, quickly. We choose not to worry. That's we one thing. We believe uh, the word of God. We confess his word. Yep. And uh, we look to him and, and not to our circumstances. Okay, so we look to him, we confess the word, and we don't look to our circumstances. And do we express this to the enemy if he comes after us? Do we tell him... Uh, for example, if he says we're no good, we're going to say, or we're weak, can we declare the word and say, no, it is written, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can I do that? Absolutely, because that's what Jesus did. That's exactly right. Okay, so we'll move on to the next portion. How do we exercise or put on the helmet of salvation? Anyone? Tom, how do we put on the, sel the helmet of salvation? <laughs> Trick question. Be careful. Are you there, Tom? I guess he's not. Okay, someone else. You hear me now? Yeah, Tom, how do we put on the, the helmet of salvation? Trick question. By knowing that we're saved, I'm, I, I can't explain it. Uh, okay, when, but we're knowing that we're saved, but uh, how do we get saved? By, by having the assurance in, our, in us that we are saved. Oh, is it something that we do or is something God does? Something that God did for us. Oh, okay. So he puts on the helmet. Trust in God completely, yeah. Okay, so he puts the helmet of salvation on us, not us. Amen. Okay, that's what I was getting at. Very good. Now, how do we exercise prayer? There are two offensive weapons that are mentioned in that passage. One is the, the and they're both contained in the sword of the spirit. What is the sword of the spirit? Two things. One, sword of the spirit. The word of God. The word of God, two, right in the passage. Look at it. Let's go back. Here's the sword of the spirit. One is the word of God and the other. Prayer. That's it. Prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So if you have a strong life in the word of God and you have a strong prayer life. And I'm not talking about a prayer life just to get rid of demons. No, 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 no. I'm talking about an intimacy with the Lord, a consistent prayer life, a consistent coming into his presence, an established cultivated relationship with God. You will not have any problem with the enemy. And you'll notice there, there's no mention of rituals, no mention of ceremonies, no wretched, no mention of any special knowledge that you have to have. It's just being consecrated before God. And that's how you deal with, that's how you exercise spiritual warfare. All right, let's move on to the next section. Second Corinthians 10 verses two to six. 
let me just make some more room here. I, I need to extend this a little further. There we go. There, that's better. I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence, that I may be, not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. What Paul is saying is don't think we're anything special in ourselves. For though we walk in the flesh, even though we're human, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So the weapons of our, warf of our warfare are for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, bringing down every high thing and capturing every thought. How do we do that? The five pillars of the Christian faith. Well, that's one way. What and what are what are those, Christina? The word. Yeah. Prayer. Yeah. Um, worship. Yeah. Fellowship. Yeah. And acts of service. Acts of service. Very good. Yeah. Do we need to study? to be able to bring down arguments and strongholds? Anyone? Yes, I think we have to, to meditate on the word of God and read it and to learn what it says. That's right. What about studying what uh, people outside of the word of God believe? Do we need to study that too? Is that necessary? Let's suppose we were talking to a Hindu or a Buddhist or a non-believer or an atheist. Would it be helpful to train ourselves in how they think and be able to respond according to God's word? Anyway. Yes. Yeah, so we need to be students and we need to train ourselves and we need to equip ourselves and because a lot of spiritual warfare is just dealing with unbelieving human beings or human beings who believe in another worldview or people who hold to another system of faith. And that's a lot. Of, those are, of course, things that are inspired by the enemy, but they are manifested through human beings and we deal with them on human terms which is reason arguments scripture uh, quotations of scripture prayer etc etc so that's how we deal with spiritual it's not very not very mystical is it not as mystical as people would like us to think not as complicated as some people would have us believe that uh, the fact is that dealing with the enemy is not that difficult and that's the point that I want to make, especially for a believer. How about this one? Matthew 17, 21. However, this kind, referring to a specific type of demon, does not go out except by fasting and prayer. How do you interpret that? Anyone? This kind does not go out except by fasting and prayer. You How would you interpret that? You can't cast out the flesh. And What's that? You, you can't cast out the flesh. So some things are, you need to crucify the flesh by fasting and build up your spirit man and things will leave you when you fast. Oh, all right. That's one way of looking at it. Anyone else? This kind does not go out except by fasting and prayer. It actually is referring to a demonic spirit because that particular verse comes in the context of the disciples trying to cast out a demon and were not able to. And they finally brought the demon to Jesus and he was able to do it. And that's when he said, no, no, this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. So uh, how do you interpret that? Anyone? Yes. God for God to deal with, not for us. Oh, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, for God to deal with and not for us. Well, we should never try to take on the enemy in our own strength. We're, we're going to get bashed. Uh, somebody else, how do you interpret this kind does not come Is out? Is there a measure of uh, possession? No, there's uh, degrees of uh, demonization, but I'll get to that degrees, later. Yeah, yeah I'll, mm -hmm. get to that. I'll get to that later. But is that what that scripture is talking about? There are degrees, absolutely. And in some cases, the degree is so severe that it can only be dealt with through fasting and prayer. But how do you interpret that? Does it mean that when we run into a, a, de a high degree of demonization that we have to fast and pray to get rid of it? Or does it mean that we should have a I think, or, I think it should be I think it should be a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. Yes, I agree with you 100%. I think Jesus was saying that you need to have a lifestyle of fasting and prayer, and you'll be able to deal with any type of degree of demonization. Now, how do we know he said that? Because the disciples didn't have time or didn't have the opportunity to fast and pray to take care of that specific demon. But Jesus was constantly praying and constantly fasting before his father, and he had the authority on the human level to be able to cast out demons 
though he was at, at the same time God the Son. So this refers to a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. And that's how we're able to have the authority that we need. If you don't have a lifestyle of fasting and prayer, well, you're going to struggle a little bit. Here are some practical ways of overcoming the enemy. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, we saw the presentation on YouTube a few minutes ago, and it kind of outlined what submitting yourself to God is all about. Submit to his lordship. How about this one? You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Realize that the, the, the spirit of God in you is greater than any demonic horde. And I'm talking about a horde, not individual. Here's a good one. Let's discuss this one a little bit. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. In the faith. Can anyone tell me what that verse is telling us? We need to have discipline over ourselves. Right. We need to have discipline in our, of ourselves. Anything else? And temptation can come from any direction. Okay. Right. Very good. That's two things we need to do. Someone else. What does that mean? This is a very specific instruction to be able to have authority to deal with demonic spirits. Be self-controlled and alert. In what area do we need to be self-controlled? Our mind is the main thing. Ah, okay. The enemy our mind. will try to get us to come in agreement with lies. So that's why it says to be sober-minded so we can take every thought captive to be under the obedience of Jesus Christ. There we are. We need to be disciplined in our mind. So if anything negative comes in, we need to be able to train ourselves to push it out with the truth of God's word and his reality and truth. Anything else about being sober and being alert? How about alert? How, how can we be alert? anyone prayerfully i think that um when we pray in the spirit um we we get a, a discernment from the lord and um it helps us to to in a sense be in, on our spiritual toes exactly and, um yeah yeah we need to be we need to be alert in prayer we need to push out these thoughts by the word of god and we need to be alert meaning we just need to be on our toes not get sloppy not think, oh, you know what? I don't need church. I don't need to read the word of God. I don't need to pray on a regular basis. I don't need Christian fellowship. I'm okay on my own. When we do that, we become very sloppy and we leave ourselves wide open to demonic invasion. Now, Mark had mentioned something about degrees. I'll get to that a little later, but right now let's continue. And we're moving along and boy, this Bible study is going by fast. It's already 811. How about this one? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me. Their vindication is from me. Tom, what, is, what do you think that means? Their vindication is from me. Whoops, I don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, it means that because we're in Christ, we, the devil can do anything to us. And if he uh, tries? God will vindicate. There we are. If he tries, God will take care of it. We should not try to deal with it in our own strength and in our own wisdom. Very good. Now, you'll notice that the word of God really takes the mystery out of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is very straightforward, very practical, very, 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 very uh, easy to understand. There's nothing spooky about it, nothing weird about it. Just be strong in the Lord and you'll have no trouble. Be thanks. That thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what do these verses tell you? These verses tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that you need to know who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's more. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. But the Lord is faith. That's Zechariah 4, 6. The Lord is faithful and will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. Finally, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. What do these three verses tell you? There they are. I'll put them up. What do these three verses tell you? What can you glean from these three verses? 
It's Start. God's battle. Well, I beg your pardon? It's God's fight. It's God's fight. Okay, that's one. Yep. Something else? How about this one? Verse 10, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. What does that tell you? It's God's fight. Zechariah 4, 6. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. What does that tell you? God gives us the strength. He will strengthen you and what else will he do? And protect us. Yeah, protect us. In fact, part of the Lord's prayer is deliver us from evil. And this verse ties in directly with the verse deliver us from evil. And Kofi, what about this one? Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. What do you make of that one, Kofi? What does that say to you? Um, that in Christ, uh, we have authority. Okay. And uh, we are able to um, come against uh, all, uh, all power of the, the enemy. Okay. And the word tread, when you think of the word tread, what do you think of? What image comes to your mind? Uh, to step on. To step on, right. To crush underfoot. That's exactly right. Yeah. Which again, from the, from the word of God, we are learning that we have absolute authority over the devil and we are able to crush him under our feet. He does not have the power to dominate us. And that's what those five influences that I showed you before the Bible study started have done. They've actually reversed that and made us think, made Christians think that fighting the devil is a big deal, and he's so powerful, and he'll overwhelm us, and we need to fight, 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 and we'll barely get by, because Jesus is just slightly more powerful, which is an absolute total falsehood. We need to shut down these ridiculous lies, and if we've had any experience with the occult in the past, we need to put, forget that, shut it down, tell the devil, you have no more influence over me. I'm a child of God. You can't touch me anymore. Because if you keep thinking about it, and if you believe that he can touch you, he will. That There's another level of faith that the enemy acknowledges, and that's faith in him. We don't have faith in the devil. We have faith in the, in the Lord and in his word. Okay, let's move on to the next section. Boys, can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, there's, um, there's also a proactive, I think, um, uh, commission that's, that has been put on us as Christians as well. Yeah. It's not only passive, it's, it's active as well, which yeah, is definitely. declare, which is to declare and, and, and de decree, you know, that we have the authority that we, you know, can cast out, uh, spirits because otherwise there wouldn't be any ministry of deliverance. That's exactly right. Well, I'm not saying there's no deliverance ministry. I'm saying there is a deliverance ministry, but it, right. needs, to, but it needs to be exercised biblically. Right, and, exactly. And the deliverance ministry that we have is exceedingly powerful. So you were saying, Mark, that we have authority. Our authority is so great. I don't think that most Christians have fathomed just how great our authority is, which, is, which is probably why these books, these bad influences that I mentioned to you give methods of trade treading on the enemy. You remember here in the verse, it says that he will give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That's another word for demons. Here are the methods of treading that I find in some Christian books. Actually using practices of the occult to deal with the occult. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that because I don't want any of you trying these practices. But Christian spiritual warfare books actually give you occultic practices to be able to offset the occultic interference of the enemy they give you rituals and ceremonies to follow specific rituals and ceremonies like anointing the oil on a certain place praying a certain way laying hands on a certain way repeating the same words in a certain way that's what i mean by rituals and ceremonies none of this is biblical gestures with physical materials i've seen people try to bring deliverance to somebody by waving flags over their head by making them pass over a hebrew prayer cloth by establishing a, a spiritual zone where people walk in and they'll be delivered in the zone. All kinds of crazy nonsense, which has nothing, nothing to do with the biblical instruction. Finally, discovering the names and identities of demons. Jesus only did that once, just once. And the rest of the time, the apostles and, uh, and Jesus cast out uh, the enemy without mentioning his name. But this has driven Christians to try to discover the name of every possible demon that exists. And there's a new one that I just discovered three weeks ago, taking demons to court. Now, I've never, I've never heard of this one, but apparently 
this preacher teaches that if the enemy is harassing you, that you should bring him before the court of the Lord in prayer and say, judge between me and the devil. And the Lord will always judge against the devil. That's just bizarre. It's not biblical. It's just bizarre. Now, here's another classic that people have misinterpreted. And I want to find out what you think it means. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. What do you think that means? That oh. chapter is chapter is entirely about church discipline. Yeah, that's part of it. Yep, church discipline. But it's been but that that passage has been misinterpreted. Can somebody tell me how? How has that verse been misinterpreted and added to the folklore of spiritual warfare? Nobody knows. I'm surprised nobody knows this because this team, by, it's been by, uh, by, abused by, by spiritual by, decrees. No, on, Mark, Mark, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, by spiritual decrees, whatever we decide to bind and whatever we decide to loose. Yeah, so in other words, people are going around binding this and binding that and loosing this and loosing yeah. that. And they take the verse out of the context. It has to do with the authority of the church to discipline its own. Thank you, Paul, for mm. mentioning that. I appreciate it. It has nothing to do with binding and loosing uh, demons. And yet, this is how people use it. Bind, I bind you, Satan. I loose the Spirit of God to work in your life. You don't have to loose the Spirit of God to work in somebody's life. All you have to do is preach the Word of God, and hopefully they will respond, and the Spirit will be loosed in that sense to work in their lives. And, and, and the other part of that, those last section, section we've all done is that where two or three are gathered. Again, that's about the church discipline. Yeah, again, uh, two or three are gathered yeah. together in my name. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's that could apply to anything, including church discipline, because it's true. Yeah. It's, it's true that when two or three are gathered together, uh, a sense, a great sense of authority comes. The, the, the binding and loosing and that verse taken together speaks of the church's authority. So the church has the authority to discipline and the church has the authority to petition God for anything, which is why the video that we watched at the beginning of the Bible study talks about Zion being the city of refuge, a city of protection against the enemy. Well, that's the local church. That's the gathering of God's people in Bible study and church services, being committed to a group of people. That's extremely important in the Christian life. So that's where the authority comes from, not only from the Lord individually, but also corporately together as we seek him. Okay, we're moving along. This has been very good so far. And let's go on to this. Oh, yes. I won't talk about Liberty Savant. I will just leave her alone. Liberty Savant. I'll just mention it quickly. She was a, a lady who wrote a book about binding and loosing that was completely out of the context in the way that we were talking about it. Now, here's one. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Well, the devil uses temptation against us. That's one of his primary strategies. But God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Does anybody want to comment on that? The enemy will use temptation against you. But how can we resist temptation? Anyone? How can you resist temptation? By not entertaining it. Yeah, but okay, by not entertaining it. If you're hooked on pornography, don't watch it. <laughs> That's one way. If you're a glutton, don't eat as much. If you're angry, control your temper. And you need the Lord to be able to do that. Anybody else have something to say about temptation? There's what about well, the a Lord better says, thing uh, to do? Hang on a second, one at a time, Oliver. There's always something more godly to do. There's always something that God will allow you to do instead of doing the, the evil thing. Okay, so di just divert your attention to something godly and forget about the temptation. Yeah, that's one way of handling it. Okay, that's but good. There's also, but there's also, too, I think, figuring out why you're tempted. Yes. Where, 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 because the thing is, is that how can you fight those temptations if you don't know the cause of it? For example, my cousin, I've got a cousin who has been, she just stopped, a, She's. I think it's been three months since she stopped using pot. And for her, one of the process was to figure out, well, when when would she use it? Why would she use it? And all these questions about relating to her usage. Once she identified those reasons, when she decided to get clean, and she's been clean for three months, 
she was able to better handle it and be able to overcome those because goodness knows she's still she's still tempted but because she knew the identifiers she was able to divert so for example i think one of her thing one of her uh, uh her uh, her stressors or was when she was stressed when she was stressed she would smoke pot so instead yeah. of smoking pot she has to find something else there you go. And it's that always identifying why am I doing, why do I want to do this, and okay. then find the alternative. Great point. Yep. yep. You've got to know your weakness, which is why when uh, in the past I've preached, you've got to know what you're like when you're in the flesh, and you've got to know what you're like when you're in the spirit. Just as a matter of survey, use your reactions in the corner down there in the strip below. How many of you know your own weaknesses? How many of you know where you're going to get tripped up? more than any place else. Just give me a thumbs up or a wave. Let's see how many of you know your weaknesses. Almost every, quite a few, quite a few, quite a few. How many know your weaknesses? Okay, well, that's great. That's a, a step in the right direction. And uh, how many of you know how to overcome that weakness? Same thing, thumbs up. Good. I can give you an overall strategy for dealing with weakness. Don't focus on it. The more you focus on it, the more you're going to fall into it. It's like the devil. If you focus on him, he will come. Focus on Jesus. Trust in him. Seek him. All right, let's move on. We really um, on, on that, I'll come back, though. Uh, yeah. We must remember being tempted is the sin in itself. Um, Jesus was tempted after all. It's basically coming to that temptation. So an old pastor of mine used to say, you, you may not be able to present, prevent a bird landing on your head, but you can stop it making a nest. <laughs> right, you can stop making a nest. <laughs> Very good. And speaking of Jesus' temptation, here we are, the most powerful biblical method for dealing with the enemy. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. And now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands uh, they shall bear you up, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, that he said to him, all of these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. So the, one of the best ways to learn about spiritual warfare is observe how Jesus did it. How did he do it here? How was the enemy defeated at the Mount of the Temptation? Anyone? With the word of God. Yeah, with the word of God. That's right. And you'll notice that the enemy attacked Jesus on three fronts. The lust of the flesh. Turn these stones into bread because you're hungry. If you have a scratch, if you have a scratch, uh, if you have a, an itch, scratch it. <laughs> if you have a, a passion, fulfill it. If you have a lust, make sure you, you pleasure that lust. The pride of life. Throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple so you can become famous. And uh, the lust of the eye. Look at all these things that I'm showing you. I own all the kingdoms of the world, which was not true because all the kingdoms of the world belong to God. And I'll give them to you if you worship me. So the same three temptations that he used in the Garden of Eden, he used on Jesus and failed on each point because Jesus knew the word of God. And by, for your information, every scripture that Jesus used came from the law of Moses. Isn't that incredible? So when we use scripture, we don't have to go to the law of Moses, but we can go to the law of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is no condemnation to those who are in the Lord uh, and who have the spirit of God living in them. All right. Now let's move on to our last segment, which is, oh, yes, this one. Then they came to the other side of the sea to a country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling amongst the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. 
And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him, they begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now you can learn a lot about demons from this passage of scripture. What can you tell us? Anyone? You'll have to read between the lines on this one, but this passage has a lot of information of what demons can do and what they can't do. So what can they do? What can't they do? Anyone? I'll give you an example. They can torment a man and give him unusual strength. See that? And I've seen that with my own eyes, that uh, when somebody is oppressed by a demon, that he can have unusual strength. Is there anything else you notice about demon spirits? What about this? What does that tell you about them? They are still subject to Christ. They still created beings at the end of the day. That, that is correct. They are created beings and they submit completely to Christ. Not only that, but they're scared to death of him. All right. What about this one? What does this tell you about demons? It sounds like they can control animals. They can control animals. I would say that they can enter into animals, yes. But what is the condition what is the condition for for demons to do anything jesus permission that's right they can't do anything to you that the lord will not allow so that's an extremely important point all right here are some myths concerning satan and his angels number one satan isn't as active in our world as one would think he's just a myth a fantasy created by the christian church the one of the devil's most effective weapons against unbelievers is to prove or to make them think he doesn't exist Satan and his armies can possess Christians. They cannot. He cannot possess a Christian. We often forget that Christ living inside of us, God has, holds all power over evil forces of this world. This means that Satan cannot overpower us. God is stronger than Satan. Not to mention Satan wouldn't want to be in close proximity with someone as holy as God because he has the spirit of God living in him. Anyone in scripture who is possessed is not a believer, such as the man possessed by demons called legions. But if we are sloppy, we can be externally oppressed. Now, this brings me to the point of uh, degrees of oppression. The word for uh, demon oppression in the Greek is demonaze, demonaze. Demonaze means demonization. The word possessed by demons does not exist in the word of God. But there are degrees. Now, there are degrees that are external and there are degrees that are internal. The degrees that are external are demons bothering you from the outside, putting thoughts in your mind and oppressing you from externally. The internal op oppression is this man, Legion, who was called Legion. I mean, this man who had demons called Legion who were tormenting him and getting him to inflict wounds on himself and tormenting him. So there are different degrees of demonization. But as far as being a container in which the devil can enter into, that may be able to be true of unbelievers, but certainly not of believers. But the devil cannot possess or demonize a believer to the degree of totally controlling him. So what happens if we slip up in sin? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's another lie. Little sins do not affect believers much since we're already saved. Well, once we allow Satan to have a foothold, Ephesians 4.27, we stunt our spiritual growth and are in, unable to do the tasks that God has given us. And why is that? Because the Spirit of God will deal with the area of sin before he moves you forward. So if you've got sin in your life, that's where this concentration of the Spirit will be. Repent, give the sin to Jesus, and you'll be able to move on. Lie number four, God will take away your salvation if you sin too much. That's absolute falsehood. And this 
is another weapon that the enemy uses is a lack of assurance. You wouldn't believe how many believers I know that still do not believe that faith in Christ is enough to save them. They're worried about their performance. Lie number five, Satan and his armies have the upper hand. Well, if you watch the news every day, you might believe that, but we do not have access to the whole story. Believe me, God has the upper hand and he's in total control. And the last lie comes from the five influences that I gave you at the beginning of the Bible study, that casting out demons will be a long, drawn-out fight lasting for hours and hours. I want you, I challenge you to go into the Word of God and find me one instance, one, in which that's true. There are none. Demons are cast out with a simple word, but they're cast out by people who are consecrated, and that's where the problem rises. People who are not consecrated, people who have sin in their life, try to cast out demons, and they get pulverized. Oh, the demon will eventually honor Jesus, but not without a big fight. It's not true that casting out demons should last for hours and hours and take a lot out of you. Nowhere in the Word of God is this seen. So the conclusion, deliverance ministry is just one of the many aspects of the Christian life and should not be overblown or sensationalized. Beware of teaching that is not based on Scripture and recognize your total authority over the enemy in Jesus. As long as you are walking close to the Lord in the beauty of holiness, devoted to seeking him through the five pillars of the Christian life, Satan will not be a big problem for you. Now, I'm going to, this Bible study has been recorded, and I will send each of you a, a copy of the notes because I feel it's very important. So thank you for listening, and I'm going to ask Kofi to close in prayer. Thanks, everybody. Kofi. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we give you praise tonight, O oh God, for opening our eyes to um, this area. Um, it is a, a, an important area, and unfortunately, Lord, there has been um, a lot of confusion, uh, a lot of untruth that has been shared um, um, in many aspects, O oh God, and we just thank you, Lord, that you're, you're bringing clarity in this area into our lives, O oh Lord. We thank you, Father, that indeed you have taught us tonight that um, this uh, spiritual warfare indeed is, is by lifestyle. Um, we've seen examples of Christ uh, um, talking about being able to overcome the enemy by living a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, O oh God. And I pray, Father, that you will call each and every one of us into a place of consecration, total consecration of God in the mighty name of Jesus, mm -hmm. that will give ourselves to spending time in your presence. We will beat down the flesh of God um, and, and, and walk by the spirit, Lord, that we will totally throw ourselves on you and rely on you in all things. Father, tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, knowing that you have, given us authority over serpents and scorpions. We want to put our faith in action tonight and come against every work of the enemy that is against us, oh God. I pray for all those who are listening tonight and I declare freedom in Jesus' name yes. from every oppression of the enemy in our mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. every whispering, an accusation of the enemy, we cancel in the name of Jesus. Yes. Every negative thought that the enemy is planting in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, tonight we cancel in the mighty name Jesus. of Jesus. And Father, every activity of the enemy, any form of oppression, be it physical, be it spiritual, be it financial, be it emotional, be it mental, oh God, tonight, mm. Mm. because of the authority that Christ has given us, we come against the work of the enemy and we cancel every activity of the enemy in our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Yes. We declare freedom, we declare freedom, we declare freedom to your people tonight in Jesus' name mighty name. We thank you, O oh God, for the authority that we have in Christ mm. to serve you freely, to live freely, to live without oppression, to live in joy, 
to live in peace, to be excited about you, O oh God, and to be excited about our relationship with you, and to be able to be free to share the love that you have given us, O oh God, mm -hmm. with others. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you and we bless you. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. If you have any more questions on spiritual warfare, you can contact me on my messenger, or you can write to me at pastorlapos at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Till then, God bless you. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.